And just like that, we have arrived at the heart of component spaces. We will now talk about the component space representation of linear transformations. And if you recall, linear transformations were the main reason we turned our attention to component spaces in the first place. Because there were some linear transformations for which we simply couldn't determine the eigenvalues without the help of component spaces. And for most practical problems, that's even more so the case. So here we are. We will use reflection for the purposes of our demonstration. And you already know perfectly well how to perform reflection for simple geometric vectors. And here I have the original vector v, and here I have its image under reflection. So what I'm trying to say here is that you already know perfectly well how to do reflection in real life. So this check mark is to indicate that we understand this perfectly well. The question is, how will this transformation be represented in the component space? And it will take the three familiar steps, of which we already know two. Of course, we'll begin by choosing a basis and decomposing all of the elements of the problem with respect to that basis. And when we used addition to illustrate the concept of component spaces, there were two vectors that were being added. So two, ve two vectors had to be decomposed with respect to the chosen basis. Well now, because we're talking about linear transformations, linear transformations act on one vector at a time. So in order to reflect this vector in the component space, we would only have to translate this vector to its components. And then we'll perform, once we have the components of the vector, we'll perform the mystery operation that this video is all about. And that will give us the components of the answer. And then we'll have the third step, which is the second step you're familiar with, which is translating the components of the answer back to a real life answer, which will of course yield this vector. So what is this mystery operation? Of course, it'll be multiplication by a matrix. But what matrix? Well, that's the question. So what we're going to do now is fill in all of the steps that we're already familiar with, and then we'll concentrate on the matrix. So here we go. Step number one is choosing a basis and decomposing all of the elements of the problem with respect to that basis. And of course, we should choose a basis that's natural for this problem. And because this line of reflection is drawn at an arbitrary angle, it would certainly make no sense at all to draw a Cartesian basis. So it's a great example of that. So we'll use a basis that's much more natural for this problem. All right, but I'll still try to make it interesting. So this will be E1, points right along the line, E1, and I'll point E2 at the 45 degree angle to E1, and I'll make sure that its length is square root of two times that of E1. So they form this perfect right, uh, isosceles right triangle. So this is E2. Okay, and then the next step would be to decompose V with respect to this basis. So we will only do it schematically. We won't actually find the coefficients, but the first step would be to find the components of the vector V with respect to this basis that we'll call B. All right, so let's write down that B consists of E1 and E2. So that will be step number one. Step number two will be the mystery step to be filled in moments later. And then finally, this mystery step will produce not so much R of V, as we know, but the components of R of V. And that will be the next, and that will be the final third step. Uh, no, and the final third step is coming up, which is translating these components back to the real life answer. So here is step number one. Here is step number three. So let's now concentrate on the missing and the very interesting step number two. All right. So we're about to see how this glorious matrix is constructed. And even though we're currently talking about geometric vectors and reflections, this algorithm will actually work for all vectors, 
and all linear transformations. And in this video, I'll show you how that matrix is constructed. Then in the following video, I'll illustrate that it actually works. And then in subsequent videos, I'll give you a couple explanations for why this algorithm works. So here's how that matrix is constructed. Let's denote it by the letter A, sub R, which shows that this is the matrix, that this matrix A represents reflection R. And we should also maybe indicate that this matrix very much depends on the choice of the basis B. So you will find out that everything in the component space depends on the choice of the basis B. Obviously these elements, but the matrix as well. And all the numbers would change with a change in the basis. All the numbers, but not how these elements work. So this matrix will of course be two by two because we're dealing with a two dimensional space. And what role does this matrix play? Well, it affects the linear transformation. It takes us from the pre-image to the image, from the original vector to the image, or more precisely, from the components of the original vector to the components of the image. So this resulting vector in R2 is this matrix times this vector. So that this matrix, or more precisely multiplication by this matrix, represents this linear transformation with respect to this basis in component space. So I will try to use the terms that are not specific to geometric vectors and reflections, but apply to all types of vectors and all linear transformations. So instead of saying reflect or this geometric vector, I will say in generally in general vector and linear transformation. So here's how this matrix is constructed. We'll construct it one column at a time and each column will correspond to an element of the basis. And remember that's numbers that go in here. So here's what numbers. So the first one will have to do with the vector E1 and the second one will correspond to the vector E2. And what these columns will be is the components of the images of the basis elements. Components of the images of the basis vectors. Let's concentrate on the words images of the basis vectors. So the first column will correspond to R of E1 reclaiming this space. And the second column will correspond to R of E2. Okay, the first column corresponds to R of E1, the second column corresponds to R of E2. And in higher dimensions there would be more basis elements and we would have the uh, image of E3, image of E4, or in however many dimensions there are. That's how many columns there are in a matrix. And of course, there's an equal number of rows, because what goes in here are the components of R of E1, of the transform image of E1. So this says reflection, but of course it applies to any transformation. With respect to what? With respect to the same basis. So the algorithm is transform each of the basis elements and decompose the result with respect to the same basis and that's the numbers that go into the corresponding column of the matrix. So do you see how the algorithm has nothing to do with reflections and has nothing to do with our particular choice of vectors? It's completely general. So that's what goes in here but we'll use this specific example to illustrate this. So if this is E1 this algorithm calls upon us to evaluate the transformed E1, E1 under the transformation, the image of E1. And if you remember the operation of reflection, the image of E1 is E1. So this is R of E1. So it is itself. So one of those situations where something being more simple actually ends up being a little bit more confusing, potentially. But I don't think this is confusing, it's just one of those cases where it is itself, and we now have to decompose this vector with respect to this basis. So it's all about decompositions. It's almost like we're in the first lecture 
all over again. Uh, or when did we do decompositions? Very early on. So it's almost like we're going back there. And it's, this subject is continuing to be all about decompositions and linear combinations. All right, so what is, what are the components of this same vector with respect to the basis? And of course it's one zero because E1 equals one of E1 and none of E2. So it's one zero. Okay, now we have to do the same thing for E2. So let's figure out R of E2. Here it is right here. This is R of E2. Okay, and now we have to decompose R of E2 with respect to the same basis. So let's see, how would we do this? So we need R of E2 in terms of E1 and E2. So here's a nice trick uh, for doing it. So we can write that E1 is the average of E2 and R of E2. So E1, E1 equals one half E2 plus R of E2 because I'm writing this down because that's the relationship that's easy to see. And from here we see that R of E2, multiply both sides by two and subtract E2 is two of E1 minus E2. So R of E2 equals two of E1 minus E2. And let's just make sure it's correct geometrically. Two of E1 minus E2. So it seems to work. So that's a good trick maybe for figuring out what this vector is a linear combination of these two. Okay, or maybe you could have seen it in some other way. Or use the grid method if you're totally at a loss. Okay, so the coefficients are two and negative one. Two and negative one. And we're done. We have constructed the matrix that represents this linear transformation with respect to this basis. So before we move on to the next video, in which I'll show you how this matrix is used, I'd like to point out one wonderful property of this matrix that will make it immediately clear to you why component spaces are so powerful. Of course, you recall that the eigenvalues of this transformation are one and minus one. The eigenvalue of one corresponds to this eigenvector and eigenvalue of negative one corresponds to this eigenvector. And what are the eigenvalues of this matrix? Well, of course, they're also one and negative one. You can see it in two different ways. Well, number one, it's an upper triangular matrix. So the eigenvalues appear on the diagonal, or you could use the trace in the determinant to determine the eigenvalues. And of course, the trace is zero, meaning the eigenvalues are opposites of each other. And determinant is negative one, so it means it's one and negative one. So those are details, but the main point is that the eigenvalues of this matrix are the same as the eigenvalues of the original transformation. Even though the original transformation, until we introduced the basis and did this whole business, had nothing to do with numbers at all. And what's wonderful about this is that when we determine the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the transformation without using component spaces, we had to use our geometric ingenuity. It took quite a bit of geometric insight, and we did it by trial and error, and uh, I wouldn't say that we got lucky, but it's, we're, it's not guaranteed that we would be able to do it for any linear transformation. Well, once we're in component space, all ingenuity and insight goes out the window. It's no longer necessary because when it comes to matrices, we have a robust or a relatively robust algorithm for determining the eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors. So what previously took ingenuity now takes a very effective algorithm that the computer can do for us. And that right there is the utility of component spaces in a nutshell.